I guess you have to share your screen. Yep. Okay, very well. So for the final talk of today, we keep going with quantum field theory. And we have Michael Borinsky telling us about resurgence in quantum field theory. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, very, thank you very much, of course, for the opportunity to talk here today. Um, yeah, I, I, I really would have loved to join in person. I can't. I had a little hiking accident recently. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm dealing at the moment with um, these uh, seven screws there. Uh, but yeah, I already saw like very many familiar faces uh, also through the stream. So yeah, I would have loved to join and see you in person and hope to see you soon in person again soon. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some renormalon phenomenon as well. Um, and as this conference or this workshop is called Physical Resurgence, um, I prepared a couple of slides to start with a very detailed physical motivation of what I'm going to talk about. So um, yeah, so, so for those of you who are only interested in, uh, in resurgence and more the mathematical side, um, yeah, so may, probably this is also interesting for you, like just for the application side, for the application motivation, why resurgence research is very interesting for these kind of phenomenon in quantum field theory. Right, so the motivation is to actually make predictions using quantum field theory. And uh, these kind of predictions, they rely on perturbation theory. And this is their resurgence comes into play. And the specific example that I want to illustrate is percolation theory, because I worked on it myself. Um, if you know what percolation theory is, uh, here's the definition. But um, yeah, if you don't know what it is, please don't read it. Um, I mean, if you know what it is, you know what it is. And uh, if you don't know what is what percolation theory is, there's a very intuitive notion. So for every one of you who have ever cleaned a kitchen sink or uh, prepared some food in, uh, using a kitchen sink, you know this phenomenon that the kitchen sink can become clogged with uh, food waste. And um, there's also, oops, uh, in particularly, you have you know that there's a gradient between this situation where the kitchen sink is perfectly clean and water flows through it, and this situation where the kitchen sink is clogged. So you can think of um, the space in between, like uh, fading amounts of food waste can be found in this kitchen sink, and you know that there's a sweet spot at which there's no more water flowing through the kitchen sink, and this sweet spot is actually exactly the critical point of percolation theory. And what happens at this point is the phase transition and um, the order parameter of the phase transition is exactly the amount of uh, food waste that are in the sink. So um, clocked or not clocked is the phase transition. So that's percolation theory, very applied. Um, the cool thing, or I mean, in my opinion, very cool thing is that you can study, oops, um, percolation theory using quantum field theory methods. And the specific quantum field theory that you have to use to, to perform computations of critical phenomena and percolation theory is uh, phi to the three theory. So phi to the three theory is a quantum field theory which comes with a third order interaction. And this is why this uh, phi to the three. And uh, this is the action of phi to the three theory. And more specifically, what you have to do is you have to compute in five to the three theory and six minus epsilon dimensions. And computations in this uh, quantum field theory can be used to compute critical exponents in quantum field theory, uh, in percolation theory. And uh, yeah, so this observation is due to many people, for instance, due to Isam, Gaunt, and Brugman, but there has also have been other works by and McFarlane and Wu, even before that, um, on the, this relationship between this universality class of percolation theory and quantum field theories. And also, I'm lying here a bit because you have to actually use a bit of a twisted version of phi to the three, uh, three theory that is slightly more complicated. 
but you have to believe me that if you are able to make computations in quite a refuse theory and six minus epsilon dimensions, can use these computations to perform computation in uh, population theory. Uh, so that's the team in which we conducted these kind of computations, John Gracie, Michael Companions, and Oliver Schnetz. Um, to actually uh, perform computations in quantum three theory at uh, this at the relevant loop order, um, you have to compute like thousands of Feynman diagrams. Um, it's about five thousands uh, in this case, and uh, we find these very uh, fantastic numbers here again. These uh, evaluations of the Riemann zeta function that we already heard about uh, yesterday in Michael's talk. So um, yes, these are great objects, uh, but computations are very lengthy and cumbersome. Um, yeah, so if you do it uh, this, then then you can, for instance, compute like one observable. Here the example is the correlation length in the vicinity of the phase transition. So here P is the order parameter. So the, if you think of your kitchen sink, that's the amount of kitchen uh, uh, food waste in your kitchen sink and PC is the position of the uh, face, the critical point. And then uh, the correlation length between different clusters in your um, population theory system is uh, divergent with an exponent with a critical exponent mu. And this mu is uh, given by such an expansion in this quantum field theory perspective. So this expansion now involves all these nice zetas uh, that we work very hard for, but we can also just, uh, of course, evaluate it numerically and we get a nice numerical expansion. And the expansion parameter is epsilon and we call that our dimension is six minus epsilon. So six is the critical dimension of phyto the free theory and this population theory phase transition. And we, are, of course, are interested in epsilon beyond six because we know the critical exponent is just two in exactly six dimensions. But uh, if you want to compute, for instance, in three dimensions, uh, where, which is a very interesting calculation theory phase transition, or uh, more relevant for the kitchen sink, two dimensions, so they set epsilon to four in this case. And uh, to actually do this, we just plug in like values for this epsilon in this expansion. And I also should mention that so uh, these coefficients in this expansion, they have been computed by Samuel Goldman in 87. Then there also um, the third coefficients by Bornfirm, McCain, and Kirkham in the 80s. And then John Grayson computed the fourth coefficient, and this new coefficient is the fifth coefficient in this perturbation expansion. Uh, by Gracie, Companions, and Schmitz, and me into some uh, last year. So um, it's very, very valuable to, to know this number, but now we want to get the most out of it. And as you already have guessed, uh, might have guessed because of the reason of the, this conference, this is going to be a divergent expansion, this expansion epsilon. So if we look into this now in detail, so we so it's always like one of a new because this is more um, convenient to compute, but you can also just translate it to new. Um, we have this expansion in terms of epsilon, and of course these coefficients of this expansion. So this one of a new expansion. If we just string up the coefficients and call them new n, we know from instanton estimates and. In can controversial these kind of computations, but they are pretty convincing that we will find eventually some factorial growth rate, some exponential and some gamma function model related uh, growth rate of these coefficients here. So of course, with these five coefficients, we cannot yet see this factorial divergence. We only have five coefficients, but we know that eventually it's going to be a divergent um, series. And that means that eventually resummation is needed to get like a very, to, to get a well-defined. Sorry, there's a question. 
Uh, sorry, oh. Michael, here it's Marco Serone. I have a question. So uh, is alpha actually known in the epsilon expansion at six minus epsilon? Uh, yes, uh, alpha is, is known and the data on alpha is pretty good, I would say. Beta, not so good. There's also computations, but unfortunately they are conflicting computations of the same numbers. So there are two, there are multiple computations, but they have different results for this beta number here. But alpha, there's agreement. Yes. And is positive or is um, it positive? I mean, Real it depends. Positive. Uh, I actually don't know, but it should be negative. It's alternating. So, yeah. So it's, it's negative. Uh, it's negative. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I'm no asking big, big. Okay. Sorry, because I have can, can a very related question. So, since the starting theory is ill defined, not perturbatively, because phi cube mm -hmm. is an unbounded potential. So one has ah. the expectation that uh, this series should be somehow, yeah, alternating sign uh, might be optimistic. But aside from that, I wanted to ask, uh, how can you defend uh, uh, the fact that the starting point is ill-defined because of the path integral doesn't, uh, does, is not convergent. Now, how can you, I mean, perturbatively, it's fine, you know, the, this percolation yeah. points, but yeah. perturbatively, how can you defend this? Uh, so first of all, we are not really working in fact the three theory, we have we work on this twisted version. So we are decorating the vertices with a POTS model. And there you get some provisions for all the diagrams. So I'm, I didn't want to go that much into the detail, but this, this is not vanilla fact to the three theory, but it's a modified version of fact to the three theory. Um, then, um, yeah, so this is this is then about the randomization group at this point. So, yeah, of course, I mean, eventually you can argue that this theory is going to go. Um, it, it's it's not stable, but um, uh, yeah, in six dimensions. Yeah, I I don't have a detailed argument against this critique uh, about the finite finiteness of part of the three theory. In this respect, I mean, axiomatic, this is all very problematic, um, but the data works quite well. So, on this kind of computation. But yeah, so this is a subtle point there, of course. And I also don't know about the finiteness properties of, um, of this twisted version that is relevant for population theory. But yeah, very good question. Uh, thank you. Um, all right. So, um, so I just want to mention this still because of the motivation, but I mean, these are the results of these kind of computations. So you can plot the estimates for our critical exponent now. And uh, so this is a plot in the dimension. So we have dimension five, four, three, two, becomes more interesting. Um, and uh, this is the value of the, this, the critical exponent mu which governs the divergence of the correlation length. And um, so here's already a problem that is very relevant for um, resurgence or resummation techniques, because this is a collection of different methods that, are, that we used for the re resummation and they all have different features and advantages and disadvantages. And sometimes we take into account this value of alpha Sometimes we try to also try take into account this value of beta. Um, the problem is that the more different uh, uh, things you have, like as methods to resum something, the more things you can, of course, um, get out of your computation. So in a way you can say, um, there's a resummation method to get any result you want. And um, yeah, so there's no, clear canonical resummation method that you should use. Uh, the most sophisticated one is here, this orange line. Um, uh, this is the borel Padé type resummation uh, theory. And you can see that it's, um, it still has a quite large error here, but um, you get sort of a nice prediction of this critical exponent. In this regime here in three dimensions, which is very interesting, it's not quite competitive with um, lattice computations based on Monte Carlo. So this is very small bar here, but 
but of course in in higher dimensions um we are the the, the estimates here from part of theory are much better than the Monte Carlo estimates. Um, then in two dimensions, we know the exact value thanks to conformal field theory methods. And uh, so there, the resummation unfortunately fails, uh, more or less. But uh, we can also use this constraint in two dimensions to improve the resummation because we know the value in two dimensions can say, okay, we, we constrain our resummation. And so, for instance, we have this most fancy constraint resummations based on Borel Pade. Here, this is CKP 172. Uh, complicated nose, unfortunately. And this is this um, rightmost uh, result here, which is already quite accurate. Uh, but yeah, so the one of the problems here is, of course, that one would really like to have like a clear cut canonical method to do these kind of resumations that are clearly the best and that can also account for like constraints in the resumation. And um, yeah, so, so, so something to sort of count on. Um, all right. Uh, then the question is, of course, so we work very hard. To get these numbers, to get these five coefficients. Um, the question is so if you continue, if we go to six loops now, um, do we get more accuracy? Um, and so, as was already mentioned, so this the resumation partially requires knowledge or estimates of alpha and beta. There are two options. We can just infer these, um, these numbers like from fitting from the five, first five coefficients. Um, yeah, you might have tried this yourself. Five coefficients is not quite much. So to actually estimate asymptotic growth rates from five coefficients is very hard. So the results not very good. And um, yeah, otherwise we can use limited information on these large order computations in this regime. Uh, but the results are unfortunately very controversial. Uh, and there's a really concrete problem here because from six loop on, all these errors that are come from this resumation, they add up and they become dominant. So they um, they exceed the expected increase in accuracy from the next coefficient because we don't know enough from this non perturbative regime. And um, yes, we get very diminishing returns uh, if we compute everything up to six weeks here. And this really, is like one of my main motivations to look into this and to really try to push like for higher to, for more information in this non perturbative regime of these um, perturbative expansions because it's really needed for phenomenological predictions uh, and uh, these are real world predictions that have like real world applications for your own kitchen sink in your home um so yeah so insights into these non perturbative effects really make a difference. Uh, so yeah, so just some summary here. So partially we already computed these six loop um, Feynman diagrams. So there's like still many more uh, Feynman integrals to com uh, compute these Qs here are codes for the zeta values. And uh, the obvious question is like, what can we say about the large order behavior on these kind of computer theories? To actually improve the accuracy of these kind of predictions uh, for phenomenology. All right, and this is what brings me to these renormalon um, computations in uh, four and six dimensional quantum field theories. You all know that renormalons are only like one source of uh, non perturbative effects in these quantum field theories, but um, this is what I'm going to focus on the rest of this talk. Uh, hope so. Um, and these are in six and uh, in four dimensions. These phenomena that I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is based on work on joint work with David Broadhurst um, from this year, where we looked into all uh, order resurgence of a five to the three theory phenomenon. And so uh, this is the most up to date work. Uh, then last year, there was some work with uh, Gerald and Max Meinig, 
uh, where we also looked into the same uh, renomalon in fighting with three theory in a bit of a more bird's eye fashion. And we also associated it with the uh, renomalon. And then um, two years ago, there was the initial work on this where we st studied the Dutch Springer equation uh, that governs a four dimensional renomalon in Lukava theory. And this is sort of one of the base cases for these kind of later works now. We were also able to make an all order, uh, all order fun series analysis in this case. Okay, so the non perturbative uh, handle that we are using there are certain Dyson Schwinger equations. So um, these Dyson Schwinger equations look as follows so it's like A in the Yukawa theory case and B plus four. So there are different cases that I'm going to discuss. One of them is Yukawa theory in four dimensional space time dimensions. And uh, these Dyson Schwinger equations look as follows. So you have a fermion propagator and B plus four. And um, of course, the first order is just the, the single meson interaction of the so one oops, one loop contribution to this fermion um, propagator. And then we include higher order corrections to this uh, one loop propagator by just inserting this blob here on the left hand side again into itself. And we insert like a chain of these blobs into itself. So we sum of all these chains of uh, insertion of the whole block into itself. And then we have to account for uh, randomization subtractions. And of course, the, the um, arrowed lines are fermions and the dashed line are mesons. <clears throat> yeah, so in summary, we, we take this one loop meson uh, propagator correction, insert it in, into itself in all possible ways and iterate it. So iterated insertions. So we have one loop, two loop, we have this rainbowish thing, but in the three loop, we also have, um, have these uh, two one loops next to each other. And then at four loop, we have like combinations of blocks. So we have these little rainbowish um, insertions into itself, but then we can also chain them up in different rainbow things. And we can, of, of course, also iterate these kind of things. And this was the subject of this uh, paper with uh, Gerald from two years ago. And uh, the other line of uh, thought is a similar story an analogous story in prior to the three theory in six dimensional space time, which is of course also relevant for our nice uh, percolation theory case. Um, here we have the scalar propagator and we do the same trick. We start with the one loop scalar propagator, we insert it into itself and then we, uh, so we insert the everything that is on the left hand side into itself and so on and we iterate so we get these kind of diagrams here so this is the subject of this paper from this year with david and uh, the subject from last year's paper with jared and Lars. Uh, i want to iterate here that here we really make an approximation so um no matter how you think about like these kind of uh, more words by axiomatic uh, viewpoints on fight of the three th theory, where you of course can argue, yeah, maybe things don't work out at all. Um, people have made like real world computations with front of three theories, and uh, the speculation theory um, computations are one specific example of this. But uh, these approximations only take a subset of these finite integrals, of all finite integrals in these quantum theories into account. So there's no reason to believe that there's like any real physical prediction that can be associated with this. So this is a disclaimer. So these are only like approximations and it's very difficult to associate them to actual physical phenomena. It's a bit like one of the N um, uh, approximations. Uh, so we replace this full 
um, sum of all Feynman diagrams that are needed to make the action prediction uh, by this very simple sum of our Feynman diagrams where we have only these, um, these iterated one loop things and these rainbowish things here popping up. So this is huge simplification. <clears throat> okay, so um, the way or the reason why this simplification is useful is because we can derive differential equations from the simplification. So ODEs, ordinary differential equations. Um, and this has been done by Brotters and Kreimer in 2000. So for A in the recover case, we um, just think about this now as representing this block, the full fermion self-energy of our to cover theory. And we say, okay, the self-energy is equal to this approximation. And what we do then is we translate this into our Feynman integral. So what we have to do, we have to integrate over this extra fermion uh, meson line up here. And if we do that, then we get the following equation. So here's the integral over the the meson line, and here we have this fermion self energy. And I mean, recall that we have this chain here of blobs inserted into uh, into this fermion line in the bottom, and this boils down to get like a geometric series of like fermion insertions into itself. So we get a nice geometric series here. And we can sum this geometric series. We get a nice expression for our um, fermion self energy. So we have forgot to. So this. So we have to rewrite like this uh, sigma tilde q square is nothing but q. Um, no, the other way around. Uh, so this is q slash top. Um, times this sigma tilde square is this sigma q. So we wrote, we, we wrote things in this very trivial way to translate from the sigma to the sigma tilde. And we get a nice integral equation. So the sigma tilde appears here and down here. So this is a beautiful integral Feynman integral equation where we have like sigma tilde implicitly given the sigma tilde is the self energy for this toy on the theory. And we just have to think about this kind of integral. We also have to take the randomization subtractions into account. Um, what's really cool then is that we can compute observables in this toy on the theory. For instance, the anomalous dimension. The anomalous dimension is like one of the observables that is also relevant for these actual physical phenomena like percolation theory. So this is called gamma. And we can write down an expression for this anomalous dimension. And what we can do with the, um, or what uh, Brotters and Kramer did, was translated this integral equation then into a nice little ordinary differential equation of first order. This is this equation here. A nonlinear differential equation because it contains uh, gamma square terms. This was our starting point for this analysis two years ago. And what's going to pop up is a, is a four dimensional renormal. And a bit of a happy accident in this case is that the full transit series solution can be stated rather explicitly. Um, so I wrote it down here in this uh, bit, uh, I mean, it still looks quite complicated, but um, you have to trust me that from this expression, if you tell me that you need, you're interested in like the 1000 instanton uh, contribution of this um, object, of this gamma, then you can just expand it immediately from this um, expression and at least write down a closed form expression for this uh, 1000 order instanton contribution quite easily. 
And it's governed by, um, I mean, this is the gamma, the anomalous dimension. This is the instanton counting parameter here, the psi. And f of x and y is an interesting bivariate function that sort of governs this all order relationship between this re resurgence relationship between the interaction of the n and the n plus one instanton in this case. Um, so yeah, so why is this an interesting interesting renormalon to study? Um, the reason is that they are, that it's um, sort of a generalization of interesting related approximations. Uh, for instance, we have this rainbow approximation for our fermion propagator as well. And the same holds, of course, for the scalar case. Everything is analogous. And uh, this rainbow approximation is sort of, as the name suggests, um, always these kind of iterated, so, so iterated one loop graphs where you always plug in a one loop graph in the middle again. Um, this is also called a ladder approximation as a variant of this. And uh, it's very relevant in, uh, for um, bound states like positronium and the beta zeta equation. And interesting about it is that it's convergent even after a randomization. So there's no, it's a, it's a convergent series. So there's no factorial divergence popping up due to this, this, um, uh, this approximation. And then there's the chain approximation, which is sort of the classic renormalon approximation, the one that also appears in the context of one over n approximations. So there we start with a one loop diagram. And we just insert like a chain of one loop diagrams inside this fermion propagator. And yes, yeah, so this is the classic hero of uh, renormalon computations. It, like I said, it also appears in one of the n computations. And after randomization, it famously divergence. So before it's actually finite, but afterwards it's divergence. Uh, the only thing is that the divergence is um, slightly trivial in the sense that we only find very simple singularities in the Borel planes, so only essentially only poles in the Borel plane. There's no non-trivial relationship between the different instanton sectors usually. Um, so that makes this combination of A and B. So, so we call that in our case, we combine like both of these different approaches quite interesting. Oops. Uh, so we, yeah, so we combine these two cases, and in this work uh, with uh, on on the recover theory, um, what helped us a lot to to make this all order um, prediction is uh, or was a happy accident, namely that we found a combinatorial interpretation of the coefficients of this um, expansion. So if you look into the coefficients of this, this expansion of this gamma, this anomalous dimension, what we find are very interesting integers. And they correspond to the number of connected chord diagrams. And uh, these numbers, they have fortunately have been studied by people like uh, Kleidman and Stein and Everett a long time ago. And these kind of, um, this research culminated in uh, work by Flagelier and Noy. In 2000, they um, summarized everything and found like a nice little functional equation that these um, such the, these generation functions or these, these functions fulfill, and this relates it directly to just the generation function of the double factorial, which is of course divergent itself, but um, it's also related to the error function, um, as uh, you might know. But um, yeah, so this is a nice functional equation that is fulfilled by this by the solution. And uh, using this uh, observation, one can easily perform like this all order transverse analysis and extract like all higher order transverse coefficients in this case using alien calculus from the surgeon. Um, I also want to mention that this role of this combinatorial interpretation was further investigated by Mahmoud and Mahmoud and Yeats in 2000. And it's an open question if such a combinatorial interpretation um, uh, might also help in the scalar case. 
So I, this, because this is such a happy accident for the Yukawa case, it seems kind of hopeless. Uh, but yeah, maybe always go to hope. Um, yeah, and these uh, uh, investigations by Mahmoud and Mahmoud and Jeet are very interesting because they also are able to find like combinatorial interpretations for the higher order instanton contributions. So this is very cool. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, how much time do I actually have? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, it was a bit late to start. So I'm a bit. Yeah, it's fine. You have about, I would say, 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, back to five to three theory, back to the kitchen sink, back to the <laughs> back to the uh, back to the roots. Um, five to the three theory and six dimensional space time. Uh, there we have the same um, background, so we can do the same analysis. And this also has been done by Bosch and Timer. We also have such a um, such a Dyson Schwinger equations. Here are the first terms, and you can compute many of them. Uh, but the first observation is that everything becomes significantly more complicated in this case. So instead of a first order ODE, we have a third order ODE. And yeah, we don't observe any happy accidents, which makes it also more interesting and um, yeah, and uh, closer to reality in a way because we don't. We don't really expect like a non-generic behavior from the general case. <clears throat> this was the starting point for the work from last year uh, with um, Gerald Dunn and Max Manning. Um, so here G of X is now this anomalous dimension. So I'm sorry for changing notation. So G of X is now the field anomalous dimension in this approximation in part of the three theory. And also I have to mention that we changed uh, because of sign issues, we changed like to imaginary coupling. Uh, in part of the three theory, each loop order comes with uh, a coupling to the power of two, a squared coupling like in Q, QCD. And uh, we, we call this square of the coupling X. And we also made a negative, so x equals to minus lambda square. The lambda is the coupling or uh, minus i lambda square, whatever you prefer. Um, the ODE looks, this third order ODE looks as follows. So it has a nice um, simple form. So we have g of x times p minus one uh, times g of x times p minus two times g of x times t minus three all applied to g of x. And so this p is um, a first order differential operator. So you can see that we have a third order differential equation here under our um, observation. Um, and of course, uh, as usual, we find a unique perturbative solution of this differential equation. So. Uh, we only have a single perturbative solution, which we can just um, expand by uh, for linear numbers. So the results of this work uh, summarized from last year is, um, so we studied the phenomenon singularity in part of the three theory in six dimensional space time now. It's more complicated because uh, the full machinery is now needed. Um, and the reason for this is that we find so-called resonance phenomena. So um, the the these yeah so in principle we find log terms in the trans series solution, and uh, in this work also some questions were left open. So what are the the, the higher order Stokes constants? Uh, can we say something about the all order asymptotics of this differential equation and so on? And uh, this was eventually the setup for the work uh, from this year with David Bortes. So I want to talk a bit about this resonance phenomenon and the log terms. So we have this differential equation, third order, nicely written down. We also have our beautiful perturbative solution, but of course we know that that can be it. We have a third order differential equation and we want a three-dimensional solution space. 
And of course, as you, as you all know, this three-dimensional solution space is hiding behind non-perturbative contributions. So to actually discover these non-perturbative solutions, what we did, so of course we made a little ansatz and uh, we have, we, we put in like a little exponential suppression for these non-perturbative contributions. And um, this, uh, we also have like a, um, a like educated guess, of course, here for like prefactors and everything. Um, and uh, these non-perturbative solutions, they come in with an exponent k and k is in one, two, and three. We get one solution for each of these exponents. So the perturbation around these perturbative and non-perturbative solutions is encoded by these functions h1, h2, h3. And as you see here with this non-perturbative uh, suppression, these non-perturbative solutions, they come in a resonant ratio. So one, two, three. Because we can also just think, okay, so this action associated to the first non-perturbative solution is e to the power of e to the power of minus one over x. But if we square this action, so this this instanton, we say, take twice the we the first instanton, we exactly land at the same energy as the second original instanton, which we start here. So there's a resonance phenomenon. And of course, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three parameterize this uh, solution space. Okay, there's a question. Oh, oh sorry, it's still me, Michael. Uh, I just wanted to ask: these renormal singularities are uh, are yeah. located where you are expected to be uh, from the the law, which is an integer divided by the one loop beta function, or are uh, at some other uh, point? Um, uh, not quite. Uh, there's a bit of a deviation. Yes. But um, this is probably due to the negligence of all other um, contributions. But yeah, so so yeah, you have, we have the expectation of course to find the one of the beta function, the first coefficient of the beta function. It can be a bit explained because this one loop contribution of the beta function it involves also the vertex correction, the one loop vertex correct, correction. We didn't take this into account at all. So yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, very good question. Um, all right. Uh, there was that. Yeah, so there's this uh, folklore, uh, folklore conjecture that relates these. So I was talking about this uh, resonance, this resonance phenomenon. So these uh, three solutions that come in this nicely uh, fitting energy pattern. And uh, in a bit of a folklore way, this, um, this pattern or such patterns are associated to uh, log terms appearing in the trans series solution. Um, and indeed, what we observe is when we perform this, uh, this, this trans series ansatz, so we, we make a complete ansatz for our anomalous dimension and we String up our transverse parameter nicely, and we put in the instanton counting parameter. And here we put in some uh, perturbation around them, which are indexed now by the three instanton indices i, j, k. And uh, they are iteratively computing the coefficients of this i uh, of g, i, j, k. It reveals um, the log term surprise at uh, the second order for the first instant form. So it's exactly where you expect like the first resonance to appear. And uh, interestingly, this log term, it always comes with the uh, ambiguity. And in a way, this ambiguity can be interpreted as exactly the ambiguity that comes from defining the log as just a generic primitive of one of X. So we can always like add this as a, as a integration constant here. So the C is ambiguous. Um, and this ambiguity was the starting point now for this further in investigations uh, from this year uh, by uh, in this joint work with David Waters. 
The first result of this new work is that there exists a nice compact representation of this transduit solution. So we can package our G of X uh, trans series uh, nicely by just defining like Y of M, Y of M is just this uh, with po nth power of the trans series uh, of the instanton counting parameter, which is just this combination with the exponential. And then these M instanton contributions here can be written in terms of a contribution of sigma one, the first in, uh, uh, the first transverse parameter, but the second and third transverse param parameters they get shifted with log terms, so they have them, so some log uh, contribution now. And the cool feature about this uh, representation is that this completely captures all the log dependence of this uh, transverse. So the, the log terms are nicely packaged in the sigma two and sigma three hat representation. And um, we only, so, so besides this, we only have like power contributions, which are called, called encoded by these coefficients a m i j, depending on n. And this is simil similar to uh, to uh, work by Galfalidis, it's Papayev and Marino. Um, where they studied the Pali um, one equation uh, and also found such a neat um, packaging of the whole transfer solution. But um, yeah, this was a second, uh, second order differential equation. Yeah. Um, okay, so a bit of a question there is now that uh, so this nice packaging of the of these log terms. It sort of suggests so already with this idea of thinking of the log as the primitive of one of the X, it suggests um, the existence of a so called cancellation mechanism, a reality cancellation mechanism. Uh, because it's observed in quantum mechanics that these um, non perturbative solutions of um, physical observables, they have a phenomenon if you add like non perturbative contributions. They can give like uh, non trivial imaginary parts, but these imaginary parts are being canceled um, in a nice instanton interacting pattern. And this is this cancellation um, mechanism by Zing, this and so on. And uh, the question here is if we can associate with, with this nice packaging of the log terms with um, such a cancellation mechanism and derive something. Uh, for the monodromy, so the behavior under analytic continuation of this uh, G of X function from this. Uh, so this is an open question. Um, the second result um, also concerns these peculiar log terms. And the result is uh, in negative in the sense that this folkloric conjecture turns out to be false. So in general, these um, these uh, resonance phenomena they don't seem to imply the appearance of these log terms and um, to illustrate this we repeated our analysis for a simpler ODE so we sort of have g tilde now uh, with the same pattern of differential operators but only applied twice so it's only a second order differential equation so this is a simplification of this third order differential equation. And here we have this uh, differential operator again. And in this case, we don't observe the appearance of log terms in the trans solution. So the trans solution features this, um, this uh, instanton action ratio of one to two, again, in this case, uh, but no log terms. And the obvious question there is um, how can this terminology of resonance be generalized? So is there some way of looking into a differential equation and immediately telling if they are going to be log terms eventually or not? So this is a bit of a puzzling question um, uh, from this work. So the third result is um, also uh, quite fun. Uh, it's um, ambiguity fixing by maximal asymptotic simplicity. So uh, now 
we have this nice transverse ansatz for our solution of our differential equation. Now I want to focus, so I want to shift focus on the actual coefficients of those transverse um, ansatz. So these are the coefficients here, a, i, j, m, and they also depend on n, of course. And you want to plug this whole monster into this third order differential equation. And of course, we want to determine these coefficients here uh, completely from this differential equation. But if we try to do this, we will fail because there's some ambiguity. So if we try to do this very naively, the, the, if you make a computer try to do this, the computer will complain. It will say, it needs more information. This uh, differential equation is not sufficient. So and it needs three data points. Um, so the first data point is just scaling. It's very simple. Uh, and we can just fix this first uh, ambiguity by saying uh, the first coefficient, the very first coefficient is supposed to be minus one, which gives like nice, um, this, that has nicer consequences than plus one, but we could have also taken plus one, with no difference. Uh, the other two ambiguities, they are more subtle, um, and they sort of are hidden inside this um, expansion, and they are exactly hidden at these points where the log terms appear. So you can remember that it's, there are two log terms here, one hidden behind the sigma 2 and one hidden behind the sigma 3. And uh, for each of these logs, we have like one bonus ambiguity, and we can sort of think that we can fix these logs um, we actually, these logs are actually just primitives of one of X. So there's no integration constant specified. And we have to specify this integration constant. And we fix them by setting these two coefficients to this rather alarming uh, rational number. We could have also chosen zero or something like this, but this rational number turns out to have the effect on the large order behavior, because of course you recall that choosing these numbers at the low order has a huge influence on the large order behavior of these coefficients. And we choose this specific number to make the large order behavior of these coefficients as simple as possible. So we observed and we actually, so this number here, it has been determinated in non-exact arithmetic. So we had to fit this number from the asymptotic behavior of these uh, coefficients for large n to infinity. And uh, yeah, thanks to my collaborator, David Brotters, um, we, we were able to uh, compute like many coefficients and fit them very accurately. So we needed some quite some precision to get out this rational number here and actually make sure that it's a rational number and not some transcendental number in disguise. And this way we fit this number and we were able to achieve this maximal simplicity. Uh, for large n. <clears throat> and this is the last result. Um, this uh, conjectured uh, um, behavior of these coefficients now under this maximal simplification. Uh, maybe we can zoom in a bit here. Yeah. So um, that's the. Uh, oh, so this does not really work that well. Yeah, I'm sorry, so no zooming. Um, so this uh, this is the large order behavior for these coefficients. And um, so the, the, these coefficients, they of course encode their own asymptotic behavior again as well. So this is the typical uh, um, resurgence phenomenon that's here observed. And the dominating behavior of these coefficients is uh, given by some gamma functions and di gamma functions and tri gamma functions down here <coughs> and um, the the whole meat of this expression is in this linear combination of these different um, higher order of, of this uh, high large order for n and low order in these asymptotic expansions behavior so in a way, we can think of this as a matrix that maps this um, these coefficients here to their own asymptotic behavior. And this is this um, 
this um, alien derivative or Stokes matrix. <clears throat> These coefficients here, uh, this S, uh, are of course, the Stokes constants. Um, these are overall coefficients, overall transcendentals. We find six of them in this case, and uh, we can compute them all numerically. And also, we were able to um, to make this picture clear um, about the behavior of these similarities in the Borel plane. So we can explain these um, these rational numbers that appear here in the arguments of these tri and di gamma functions and so on, and the alternating signs based on analysis of the alien derivatives of these um, coefficients in this um, in the transfer analysis for Borel plane considerations. Okay, so here um, we have these uh, Stokes constants. Okay, again, thanks to these um, very large order uh, um, computations that we are able to do, um, we can fit them up to hundreds of digits of accuracy. And uh, yes, yeah, so we can we can um, compute them, but they all seem to be transcendental numbers, and they all seem, seem to be very independent of each other. Uh, so respect by high order computations. So to summarize, um, we evaluated uh, this. So to summarize only this work uh, from from this year, we evaluated an all order transfer solution in the wild, without any happy accidents. And uh, key to the analysis was this log term absorption, and this principle of maximal asymptotic simpli uh, simplification that resolved our um, ambiguities. And we also make clear that these log terms are a bit um, puzzling and play a quite intricate role. <laughs> and uh, yeah, also we have many to do's. Um, so the dependence of the renormalization scheme is very interesting, especially in the perspective of um, physical applications to phenomenology like these uh, critical exponent computations, uh, because these critical exponent computations, they happen in the minimal subtraction scheme, whereas these renormalon computations, they happen in momentum subtraction schemes. So one, one has to translate between the two schemes. And there's interesting, very interesting works by um, Paul Baldo uh, from last year, and also from uh, Gerald Dunn and Max Meinig, uh, who studied these kind of questions in the context of part of the four theory. Uh, based on like available data and the large order behavior. Um, yeah, so so for the application to um, to uh, QFT phenomenology in uh, higher dimensions, one really needs more large loop order data that does not rely on um, on approximations. And uh, yeah, so these are very difficult. These computations. Because you have to take into account instanton effects, and you have to renormalize these um, instanton effects. And if possible, you need to renormalize these instanton effects in the in dimensional regularization work in perturbation of, say, six dimensions or four dimensions, and um, actually account for these renormalization effects in the in the on the instanton or large loop order level. All right, that's uh, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, thank you for the attention. And yeah, thank you very much. Questions, comments? Just a simple question about your uh, existence of logs. So, did you? Just for for fun, try other different uh, uh, approximations to your equation to see whether when the logs disappear, or not disappear. Do you have any other insight um, on that? Yeah, I mean we have the uh, the only other way that we have uh, the only other example that we have is the one with only like one differential operator. So where we still erase like another um, term. In this differential operator and end up with the first order or the e, but in this case we just get this Yukawa case. 
So it, it, this uh, is the first, the simpler case where we have the all order analysis and we also don't have blocks. Um, but yeah, no, we didn't uh, look into other perturbations, no, only this one. Any more questions or comments? Okay, so let's thank Michael again. My pleasure. So that's it for today. See you guys tomorrow.